Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch, a refreshing lunch. We're just about ready to go into our final panel for today and our final panel of the conference. As a reminder, I'd like to ask you to adhere to COVID-19 protocols, by which I mean, please remember to wear your mask properly while you're inside the auditorium. And by properly, I mean covering both your nose and your mouth. Also, feel free to use hand sanitizers that are in your conference bags. And if you would like to wash your hands instead, you can go out into the left where the restrooms are. Remember that the seats that have the blocked signs are for your safety and protection. So please pay attention to physical distancing cues. And if the NCDC folk who are walking around and making sure that all is as it should be, if they have any requests, please kindly uh, comply with them. Like I said just now, we will go into our final panel of the day, the way forward, investigating allegations of violations, prosecuting perpetrators, and providing assistance to victims. At the beginning of, of the conference yesterday, we spoke about the need for accountability. And it's a theme that has run through over a couple of our panels between yesterday and today. So this is the panel where we will explore that. To begin this session, we're going to watch a video from Education Above All. This is the Unite to Protect Film 2021. Can we have the video, please? Good morning, class. David? Yeah. Fahima? Ivan? Jasmine? Jasmine? And it up. Maria? Okay. That was very difficult to watch, wasn't it? But I think it's important to remember that when we talk about protecting education, we're not just talking about buildings and, and money, we're talking about lives. We're talking about children and the people who work to teach them. On that note, I would like to introduce our panel. Like I said earlier, it's on the way forward, investigating allegations of violations, prosecuting perpetrators, and providing assistance to victims. Speaking on this panel, we have Mohammed, who is an affected student from the occupied Palestine ter territory. We have Ms. Mona Rishmawi, Chief Rule of Law, Equality and Non-Discrimination Branch, Office of UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. We have Dr. Robert Doya Namina, Nanima, Special Rapporteur on Children in Armed Conflict, African Committee, The Rights and Welfare of the Child. We have Dr. Cecil Aptel, Deputy Director, United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. We have Ms. Tirana Hassan, Deputy Executive Director and Chief Programs Officer, Human Rights Watch. Moderating this panel will be Mr. Anthony O. Ojuku Esquire, Executive Secretary, National Human Rights Commission of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Can we give them all a round of applause, please? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
Uh, it's good to be here. This session is um, the looking forward session. Here, we are going to look at how do we move forward after all the deliberations of the past few days? How do we ensure that justice is done for survivors of attacks to education? How do we make sure that our legal systems offer more protection through ensuring that there are legislations to strengthen investigation and prosecution and also remedies for survivors. Now, we will start by looking at the account of Mohammed. Mohammed is a student who is a survivor of attack of his school in Palestine. Now, the stories and experiences he is going to narrate are going to depict why we so seriously need legislations to strengthen accountability for such attacks and, of course, remedy for survivors. It's a four-minute video. Please watch. You can watch this video and uh, ensure that uh, how to actually uh, get, because we have suffered and uh, there are a lot of things that occurred when this attack uh, actually occurred. And definitely you, it is very, very important when you are a student to believe that anything that comes to you uh, you understand it's uh, something that can happen to you and um, one more thing is uh, this uh, we are for last time students and we face many difficulties and uh, we've been attacked from different uh, groups of uh, and I would like to tell you that the schools actually been suffered from uh, uh, different things are uh, we need to we need some of the government or I mean personalities to look at the situation we are facing because uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, life of the children how to enhance learning and we can just to look at what is happening in other countries who are not having a kind of uh, uh, problems or difficulties. And look at what is going on between the Palestine and the Israel. Uh, many things and uh, the most important things that we are supposed to implement in order to enhance learning are we should try and nominate some those who would be watching what goes on in the schools in order to have good learning in, Pal in Palestine and also to have a kind of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the, to protect uh, the life of the children. And actually, you see, life of the children is very, very important uh, because uh, uh, a, a student could not be able to learn without having a kind of uh, conducive environment. Therefore, we should try and get a kind of uh, security and schools that can be, I mean, defendable uh, because without those if these things that I am mentioning, I see no reason why that a student can have a conducive uh, environment for learning. And learning is a very important thing. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I mean, how to change the life of a student, or I mean, to the life of the children, it is to look at what are the important things a student need and and there is one more thing that I will want you to actually uh, put eyes on you see we need the, uh, the those who Ahmed um, you can imagine um, if you look at the best interest of the child principle you must consider what a child thinks in order to plan well for him 
and that is why accountability is very critical. We will now try also to look at a video from Cecil. Uh, Cecil is from the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. Um, it is shown that in the report of GCPA in 2020-2021, um, explosive weapons were discovered to be used as one of the things uh, for attack on children, on, on education in schools. So we'll be looking at this video, having in mind the need for accountability in cases of using explosives for attack on education. The video, please. The use of explosive weapons in populated areas is a terrible reality that is affecting many parts of the world. Over the last 10 years, we estimate that at least 230,000 civilians have been killed or injured by these weapons. Explosive weapons produce wide area effects, creating large blasts, spreading fragments over a wide radius. Many are inaccurate, indiscriminately harming civilians. The terrible result is that when explosive weapons are used in populated areas, civilians represent around 90% of the victims and children are particularly affected. Children are more likely than adults to die from blast injuries. They experience injuries of a greater intensity than adults and have a, a huge requirement for surgery and other health um, support. But the figures counting only those killed or injured fail to capture the true extent of the damage. The blasts of explosive weapons set in motion a series of complex knock-on effects that spread out over space and time. These are called the reverberating effects. Indeed, in addition to the deaths and injuries, in addition to the destruction of schools and the damage caused to buildings and equipment, explosive weapons have mid to long-term effect on students and educators, notably psychological consequences. This can cause higher dropout rates, hence lifelong losses in earning potential for the affected children and their communities. These are some of the mid to long term reverberating effects that the use of explosive weapons against places devoted to education have. Importantly, these effects are gendered. The barriers women and girls face in accessing education are further heightened when schools are attacked. Earlier this year, UNIDIR, the UN Institute for Disarmament Research, collated recent research on the direct and reverberating gender impacts of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. It shows that school, that school closures expose boys and girls to various yet different risks, including, for instance, early marriage and recruitment into armed groups. If and when schools do reopen, girls are less likely than boys to return due to security or insecurity perceptions and gender norms or because girls may be expected to take care of injured family members, making it difficult for them to pursue an education. This exacerbates gender inequalities for years to come. This also points to the importance of gender-sensitive protection, response, and relief strategies. So what can be done to contribute to accountability for attacks on education in the form of explosive weapons? Accountability is complex and we need to all work together in synergies to foster accountability. Considering the time limitation, let me concentrate on one important dimension. To foster accountability in all cases, we first and foremost need data, solid data, that measure the impact of the use of explosive weapons on education. Yet, this data seldom exists. To support the recording of these data, UNIDIR prepared and published a menu of indicators to measure the reverberating effects on civilians from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, providing a framework for systematic and standardized data gathering. It also supports the disaggregation of data, notably by age, to measure the impact on children, and also by gender, to better know the impact on girls and on boys. States, international and other organizations, foundations um, should all develop and form mechanisms to collect and share sex and gender and age disaggregated data 
on the direct and indirect effects of explosive weapons. Thank you so much. And um, this has just also exposed another dimension of the effect of explosives as attack on education and how this can also lead to closure of schools. And of course, the gender dimension. How does this affect young boys and girls? After schools have been closed, some of them are going to be exposed to all kinds of uh, sexual and gender-based violence. And she also emphasized the need for data, data on the use of explosives as attack on children, and also the need for data at disaggregation in terms of age. Now, we will go to the, um, to, to one of our panelists. I'll be asking our panelist, Mona Rishwani, at this point in time, to please talk to us on the judicial and non-judicial uh, mechanisms that can be put in place to ensure accountability as a way moving forward um, after all we have discussed on attacks on education. pleasure to be with you today. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for, so much. What I'm going to do in this short intervention is to basically set out some mechanisms that exist in the human rights system in particular, but a bit larger in the United Nations in general, about uh, how to deal with the rights of the child, uh, including including in the context of education. So an accountability, particularly in the non-judicial setting in this regard. The numbers of, uh, of attacks and violations of rights of the child, uh, particularly in the context of conflict, are, are alarming. We recorded in 2020, uh, the United Nations recorded almost 24,000 serious violations against children um, committed, due, uh, committed against nearly 20,000 children. These statistics represent young lives that have been lost or otherwise devastated by horrifying trauma and suffering, to quote the special representative, the Secretary General uh, on Children and Armed Conflict. The highest numbers of serious violations were in Afghanistan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, Syria, Yemen, as the Secretary General states. The situation of COVID-19 pandemic aggravated existing vulnerabilities of children, including by hampering their access to education, health and social service, limiting child protection activity, and shrinking safe space. The socioeconomic impact of the pandemic exposed these children to even more serious violations of human rights notably recruitment and use of abduction and sexual violence. <coughs> These child victims and their families have the right to justice, truth, and to reparations. For this reason, our office strongly advocates for accountability. We have constantly investigated violations against girls and boys in many situations of armed conflict and issued strong recommendations, including on the need for prosecution. I would like to bring to your attention in particular one our report in 2015, which documented human rights abuses against children by Boko Haram in Nigeria, Cameroon, and Niger. In that context, we documented killings, in particular abduction of children, rape, and forced marriages of women and girls, the recruitment of the use of children, uh, boys and girls, for hostility, for hostility. We received constant reports that some boys of girls were increasingly used as human shields and to donate bombs. In particular, with regard to our recommendation, we, we recommended in our report that go the governments of the states affected by Boko Haram develop and enforce rules of engagement and procedures for the protection of children and to end the recruitment and use of children in hostilities by armed, uh, by armed groups. The report also recommended that the states take measures to re-establish ch uh, children's access to education, rebuild schools destroyed, 
during attacks and to secure access to schools. So we very much welcome the initiative of, uh, of safe schools, and we think that this is an important aspect in that direction. Positive lessons on investigating and ad addressing violations against children can also be drawn from the practice of international mechanisms. In addition to judicial mechanisms such as the Special Court in Sierra Leone and the International Criminal Court, as well as regional human rights bodies, the work of the human rights investigative body established by the Human Rights uh, Council is extremely relevant. The mandates of these non-judicial bodies vary and include documenting and investigating violations as well as preserving evidence with a view of ensuring uh, accountability for these violations and that the perpetrators are brought to justice. Let me give you just a few examples. In October 2021, like just recently, the fact-finding mission uh, on Libya presented its report to the Human Rights Council, which included evidence which included evidence of recruitment and use of children by parties to the conflict and the arbitrary detention of children in hostilities. In the same session, the group of eminent experts in Yemen reported on the violations against children by all parties. The independent expert on Myanmar, uh, also and the independent investigative mechanism on, uh, on Myanmar, also declared that the investigations of sexual and gender-based crimes and crimes against children is a priority and reported that it developed specialized policies for addressing such crimes. The point that I'd like to make is that although these are not judicial mechanisms, they put a spotlight on, on what is happening and they bring a level of political accountability that actually enhances enhances the possibility for judicial account. In that context, I would like also to mention the work of the human rights treaty bodies, in particular the, the work of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Uh, in its concluding observations uh, to reports by the state party, the committee closely examined violations against children in armed conflict and makes recommendations, including on investigating and prosecuting these violations. Here, the testimony of Mohammed just before me is particularly relevant. In that context, and in the context of, the, uh, of, of Palestine, in 2020, the uh, initial report on the, uh, of the state of the, uh, in response to the initial report of the state of Palestine, the committee exp expressed its deep concern about the high number of children killed and injured as a result of, uh, of the occupation. Uh, it's, uh, and, and, uh, and the blockade on Gaza, as well as the participation of children in demonstrations and conflict-related activities against in both Gaza and the West Bank. The committee also uh, urged the state to, prompt, uh, to take prompt uh, measures to investigate, prosecute, and sanction the perpetrators in cases of child Another international mechanism uh, addressing serious violations uh, against children in armed conflict is the mandate of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for, uh, of Children in Armed Conflict. Uh, this mechanism celebrates its 25th anniversary uh, this year. I would like just to mention a few areas that came that this, as tools, as the spew of the tools that this mechanism has been using. The Secretary General report on children uh, in armed conflict presented to the Security Council includes information, uh, uh, on information on children affected by armed conflict. The, the Secretary General names parties, names parties to the conflict that commit any, any of the six violations that trigger the, and put these, uh, these names on a list. The, the Secretary General first, uh, uh, further engages the, or, his, or her, uh, his representative engages in dialogue with the listed governments and armed groups to develop, to develop action plans to hold and prevent violations against children. 17 such action plans have been developed for, so far. The listing triggered by the establishment or uh, by uh, the, the listing triggered the establishment of tools and mechanisms 
mandated by the Security Council to collect and verify information on violations against children. This allows the UN and partners to better respond, improve, and improve the protection of children and also to promote accountability. Indeed, in his last report, the Secretary General in 2020 also took note of ongoing investigations at national levels into allegations of violations and urged the relevant authorities to ensure that these investigations are undertaken. Indeed, examples of good practice by international mechanisms also need to be matched by measures taken at the national level. This is the most important step. In this regard, the international mechanisms have issued relevant and strong recommendations that need to be implemented. These include the need to integrate accountability for violations against children in peace processes and to ensure the participation of children in accountability processes, as well as the need, as well as the need for children uh, child-friendly investigations and prosecution, statutes of limitations and legal uh, impediments pre uh, preventing survivors from reporting incidents must also be re re removed. A human rights advocate and the global leader Grassa Michel, in her 1996 report, noted that the impact of armed conflict on, uh, on children must be everyone's concern and is everybody's responsibility. Governments, international organizations, aside. I believe that it is everyone's responsibility to ensure accountability for the violations against children in conflict. With this, I thank you very much for listening to me and I look forward to, the, to listening to other panelists and to the institute to the insights, uh, uh, the insights of this uh, important Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mona, for that insightful um, expose of the issues. You have taken us through the non-judicial um, mechanisms, and you particularly highlighted the non-judicial bodies established by the Human Rights Council and how their reports are contributing to um, putting countries on the spot so that legislations can be done, administrative steps can be taken, policies can be taken to hold perpetrators of attacks on education accountable. You've also made us to uh, look at the good practices and uh, also the mandate of the Secretary General of the United Nations on how his reports contribute to accountability for perpetrators of attack on education. We will now be looking quickly at um, the contributions from um, Robert Doya. Robert is of the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, and he will also be looking at um, the how strong recommendations can be made through legal systems to provide more, more, more support for victims of. Um, uh, victims and survivors of attacks on children. Can we have Robert, please? I stand on the existing protocol and I honor to be here. And I thank the government area. African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child it provides both normative guidance, but that in itself is not enough. It provides normative guidance for the protection of it. also provides recommendations on Article 22 that provides uh, an explanation on how to engage the concept of children affected by armed conflict. Uh, but it has also engaged in other things such as reports, such as research, but there was always a need to have something that speaks to the national position. 
something that could guide us because of armed conflict. First of all, the children themselves are already vulnerable. So when you add the armed conflict, it makes them more vulnerable. Secondly, they are more affected uh, by good psychological effects, such that if might not recover from these effects soon. And of Doctor, course, there are very many violations that these children suffer, such as rape and other sexual offenses, abduction. Yes, please. Dr. Nanima, yes. Um, would you like to Attacks switch your video on schools off? And would you like to switch your video off so okay. that your audio is less in, yes, it's not so interrupted. Yeah. Thank you. I hope that's better. It's already sounding much better, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So I was speaking to the fact that we have a model law that has been adopted. And the purpose of the model law is because uh, there is need to give some kind of normative guidance to states with regard to what can be done uh, to protect children affected by armed conflict, to criminalize instances of armed conflict, to provide modes of protection, modes of prevention, because uh, without that, uh, there, would still be, there would still be something missing, despite the fact that there is a lot that has been done at the international level. So because of the lack of a regional consensus uh, and lack of existence of laws, that's why the model law was uh, adopted. So the model law serves various purposes. First of all, it serves to be an advocacy tool uh, that could be engaged by the legislators, that could be engaged by civil society organizations, that could be engaged by policymakers towards national protection, towards prevention uh, of children affected by armed conflict, and also to act as a mode of best practice that could be used in cases where countries can either adopt it as it is, or they can adapt it to their, to their situations across their countries. So uh, I would say that the model law provides an opportunity for countries to engage the objectives, so, uh, that is uh, protecting the rights and welfare of the child, objectives towards guidance to national legislation, objectives towards providing clear definitions if we talk about a child who is a child, if we talk about a child soldier, if we talk about child justice systems, what do we mean? If we talk about child offenders, how do we deal with child offenders? If we are speaking about direct part in hostilities, how do we deal with those aspects? If we are dealing with restorative uh, justice, how do we deal with the aspect of restorative justice? Not from the position of only having it in a good environment where there is no war, but other environments where there is armed conflict, tension and strife, or other environments where children who have been affected by armed conflict, tension and strife move to. So this model law, uh, it provides those definitions. Then it also adopts a child rights-based approach. In other words, as you engage children who have been affected by armed conflict, whether they're in conflict with the law, whether they are perpetrators, whether you're dealing with the adult perpetrators, whether you're dealing with persons who might be condoning uh, the problem of armed conflict, at the end of the day, the question should be, is this in the best interest of the child? Does it speak to non-discrimination? Does it speak to participation? How do we have children to participate in this process? How do we ensure that we don't only speak to the right to life of the child, but uh, we speak to things that develop this child holistically? So that is survival, that's the child's development. So a holistic development, and that's what a child rights-based approach does. The model law also provides obligations on states to take all legal and other measures to protect children who have been affected by armed conflict. It engages the use of not only the human rights-based principle, but also humanitarian or such as aspects of proportionality, aspects of um, distinction, such that at the end of the day, if it's in the best interest of, if, if it's in the best interest of the child to use the humanitarian law approach, that should be used. If it's in the best interest of the child to use the international human rights approach, that should be used. It also speaks to aspects of protection of the child. How do we ensure this rehabilitation? How do we ensure this reintegration? How do we ensure that our protection can be through use of uh, other aspects from refugee law, such as non-refoulement? Uh, non we have child justice systems. How do we ensure that there is training? Such aspects. 
So uh, because of these various aspects that are brought up in the model, I believe if it's adopted by states or if it's adopted with, with some changes here and there, it could provide good guidance and perhaps at one point would have universal consensus towards the protection of the child who is affected by armed conflict. I must say there are some countries that already have uh, good practices that we should emulate from. For instance, Burundi has... Uh, it has, a, it has a constitution directive uh, towards the fact that children should not be reported into armed forces. A specific constitution directive that speaks to the promotion of, sorry, to the protection of children affected by armed conflict. The DRC Sudan, they have laws that speak to children and how they should be affected uh, in instances of armed conflict. And the other aspect that the model speaks to is criminalization to ensure that, should, that persons who have perpetrated these, uh, these offenses are, are, are prosecuted and they, are, they face their day in court and a, a judgment is handed down. So I think it's a very good remedy that gives a top to bottom approach that gives states a, a way that they could use to pledge on the various principles, various insights that have been engaged at the regional level to use in the national levels. I think uh, those are some of the aspects that I could speak to now, and I look forward to having more questions and further this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Robert, uh, for that insightful expose on um, what the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of Children is also doing. How um, you have tried to help us to understand that it's the primary obligation of states to make sure that children are protected and the education is protected, and that um, we can ensure this through stronger legislation for remedies for survivors of attack on education. We will now be moving quickly to the presentation by uh, Tirana. Tirana is uh, of the Human Rights Watch. She'll be helping us to look at uh, what are the barriers to and opportunities for accountability uh, for attacks on education? So can we have Terana, please? Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to speak after our esteemed panelists. I'm very pleased that um, we're actually talking about the question of accountability today because without accountability for attacks um, on students, uh, you know, we really, not just students, sorry, on teachers, schools and universities, will really never be able to achieve our shared goal of safe education and safe schools for all. Um, but I would like to start the, the discussion on accountability um, at, at the national level, because, you know, we can often look to international judicial processes as sort of um, a magical panacea, but ensuring accountability actually must begin at the national level. And it begins with trainings and enforcement by armed forces. And when necessary, by governments through their domestic justice systems. And it's, it's been very occasionally, but we have seen some domestic trials of perpetrators of crimes against teachers and schools. Uh, and actually, I think somebody referenced it in the chat just now, but in August, uh, two members of an armed Islamic group in Islamist group in Burkina Faso, uh, Burkina Faso, Ansarul Islam, were actually sentenced to 20 years in prison for a 2018 attack on a primary school. And we at Human Rights Watch had actually investigated this attack, and we'd spoken to the school's former principal after the verdict as well. And he actually told us, you know, it, it's a good thing to have these trials. Uh, these sort of processes are incredibly meaningful to those who've been impacted the most. But the one thing that we would say is that as governments work to eradicate violence against education, accountability shouldn't come at the cost of a fair justice system and due process. Because in, in this trial in particular, the proceedings were actually marked by more than three years of pre-trial detention. And trial observers indicated that the defendants were, were not informed in court of their rights to legal counsel under the law. 
And so ensuring that there is um, due process and credible uh, domestic judicial systems is actually fundamentally important to ensure that we have, um, we achieve uh, accountability for education, attacks on education. But also critical uh, is that governments assist victims. And this is obviously a commitment under the Safe Schools Declaration. The survivors often tell Human Rights Watch uh, investigators that they desperately need psychosocial support and compensation for losses. And, and I'm drawn back to what the former principal that I referenced earlier told uh, Human Rights Watch, which was that it's just very difficult for him. And he said he still teaches but can't forget. And so while we're doing more to encourage and strengthen domestic legal responses and assistance to survivors, um, we, we should hope that the Safe School Declaration might also provide a vehicle for providing uh, that cooperation, encouragement and support. And, you know, whilst domestic uh, accountability, of course, requires that there are rules and laws in place that can be enforced, I would like to highlight one very positive development on this front, uh, when, which is in the Central African Republic, which recently adopted a new child law. And we believe it's the first law from an African country, and indeed among the first in the world to criminalise the occupation of school for military purposes during armed conflict on the same basis as attacks on schools. And I think I would be amiss uh, to be presenting uh, here in, uh, in Abuja and not note that we understand that Nigeria is currently considering a legal amendment that would also ban the requisition of schools to use for military purposes. And if that was to become law, that too would indeed be a very positive development. Um, you know, on the international front, internationally we've not seen any recent prosecution of individuals for attacks on students, teachers, schools, or universities in recent years. And when the ICC opened investigation last year into the situation in Afghanistan, where students, teachers and schools have regularly come under attack. It gave victims hope for future justice. However, the investigation was suspended nearly as soon as it was opened. And while the prosecutor considered a request from the former Afghan government to defer to national, well, sorry, whilst the um, prosecutor considered a request from the former Afghan government to defer to national proceedings. But then last month, the prosecutor announced that he would seek authorization from the court to resume investigations in the absence of any prospect of general, uh, genuine national proceedings, but would focus on crimes committed by the Taliban and Islamic State and deprioritize other aspects of the investigation. And this approach sends a message that some victims in Afghanistan are more entitled to justice than others, and it risks undermining the legitimacy of the court's investigation. And although the Islamic State and the Taliban bear responsibility for majority of the attacks on students, teachers and schools, they don't bear that responsibility alone, as forces of the former Afghan government have also bombed schools and killed students. And we are calling on the prosecutor to reconsider this approach uh, should investigations go forward. And while, of course, welcoming his efforts to move forward and use this investigation to finally hold members of the Islamic State and Taliban to account. Um, and in relation to the UN's monitoring and reporting mechanism on children and armed conflict, you know, there, there has been a bit of good progress in this year's annual report on children uh, and armed conflict from the UN Secretary General, since it included, for the first time, the situations in Burkina Faso and Cameroon, both where students, teachers and schools have been attacked and schools have been used for military purposes. And we hope that the monitoring of those situations will actually continue to improve over this year. But that being said, um, we remain deeply troubled that the Secretary General's list of perpetrators of violations against children in armed conflict and the accompanying list of child rights violators 
continues a, a rather disturbing pattern where some parties are listed for egregious violations, while others, and particularly government forces, are not. Um, for example, this year we were disappointed uh, to see that the Secretary General did not list Afghan forces for attacks on schools, even though the UN found pro-government forces responsible for at least 27 attacks on schools and hospitals and related personnel, including at least 17 attacks by Afghan national security forces in 2020. And the Secretary General's report did not uh, list Russian government forces for attacks on schools in Syria, yet in February 2020, Amnesty International documented multiple airstrikes on two schools in West Aleppo, which were conducted by Russian government forces. Uh, and the Secretary General's report did, did not uh, even include the situations of Tigray in Ethiopia, Mozambique or Ukraine, where attacks on students and teachers and schools have been reported. So, you know, whilst the, the Secretary General's annual report and its annexes have proven their ability to influence warring parties' behaviour for the better and to promote accountability, um, it, it misses an opportunity uh, if it doesn't list uh, all perpetrators and ensure that uh, and indicate that all perpetrators must be held to account and held to the same standards um, uh, as those that have been listed. So I'll, I'll stop there, um, and I'm sure uh, we'll have an opportunity to speak more. Thank you very much, Terena. Terena has been able to let us know that accountability for attacks is very key for safe schools. And she's been able to let us know some countries that have criminalized uh, attacks on schools. She's also mentioned um, the efforts Nigeria is making to make requisitions for use of schools by military authorities. And I think the um, Terrorism Prevention Act has also been passed in Nigeria, which criminalizes terrorism activities, which includes attacks on schools. Also, there's the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, which looks at uh, issues of sexual and gender-based violence faced by children who are probably out of schools because schools have been closed down as a result of attacks. And uh, she also went forward to say that the report of the Secretary General, uh, the last report of the Secretary General, somehow did not mention the state parties, but also mentioned non-state actors. Uh, she would um, prefer a situation where both non-state actors and state actors uh, implication in attack in schools, bombing of schools, closure of schools are also uh, mentioned. At this point in time, uh, we've had a very insightful um, contribution from the presenters. We will be going into the question and answer session now, and I'll be calling on the uh, Master of Ceremonies to please um, let us know the questions that have been put onto her and go for that to coordinate the question and answer session. Thank you so much, sir. Um, very, very um, insightful conversation so far. We have a couple of questions sent in um, on the chat function, and also we will do our best to accommodate um, as well questions, in-person questions. So please, if you have an in-person question, after the first question, please just make your way to the microphone so that we can see you. The first question sent in is from Ms. Mona Rishmawi, um, and it is, are there any justice mechanisms or mechanisms for redress that non-state armed groups have used or have available to them related to attacks on education or military use? So the question about non-state armed groups using judicial mechanisms? Um, the question is if they have any justice mechanisms or mechanisms for redress that they yes. have used. Yeah. Actually, in a, a number of non-state uh, armed groups have used mechanisms to bring about accountability. And I just want to 
mention a few examples of what our, uh, let's say, mechanisms, uh, uh, the commissions in of inquiry in particular, push parties to do. It starts with actually what are the rules of engagement and what are the what what commanders uh, actually uh, tell uh, their soldiers or their uh, their armed groups. So we it should have a list. These should have a list of do's and don'ts. And the first issue, of course, that comes in are about recruitment, about abduction, about certain certain uh, abduction of children, recruit children. In armed, in armed conflicts, and the Secretary General's special representative uh, of uh, children in armed conflicts enters into commitments in this area, and there are a number of commitments. Uh, and I just think that my uh, my notes, I think there are about 35 commitments uh, done so far in these areas, and many of them are not only 35 new commitments at, uh, at least made by parties to conflict during 2020. So there are commitments that this group actually do. That, that of course, the, the most important is the implementation. And what you find, and this is where I think, in addition to the special representative of uh, the work of the special representative of, uh, uh, of children and armed conflicts, our commissions of inquiry look particularly at this area and you'll find, for example, in South Sudan, they have uh, they have done quite a lot of work asking the various parties to the conflicts there to uh, to basically issue specific instructions to their to their soldiers to basically not to attack uh, not to attack uh, educational institutions, not to recruit uh, children under uh, under 16 or. Uh, or uh, or 15, depending on the situation. Now, not to, uh, not, uh, of course, you know, the abduction and hostage taking and so on, and to hold their their uh, their uh, uh, their soldiers and their uh, those under them to come uh, responsible. Um, in all, the, in most of these situations, perhaps the, the system is not particular is not particularly perfect. But I think it is important that these armed groups actually take these commitments, these bits of commitments, very, very seriously. Um, another organization that does these deeds of commitments here in Geneva is an organization that talks, is called Geneva Call. And this organization engages with the, with the non-state actors and the parties to the conflict particularly with regard to recruitment of children on come. So there, is, there are a number of measures. Uh, so, and uh, there are rules and uh, procedures that uh, can, be, can, be, uh, can be effective. The most important thing is really that these, these rules are implemented. And from our, let's say, international law perspectives, the commanders are responsible for the acts of those under their command. Every time there is, a, there is an ICC conviction, this question of command responsibility becomes extremely important, and the ICC has been very clear that this, the commander is responsible for the acts of people under his or her command. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to do a recap or we proceed? No, just proceed. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is for you, Ms. Hassan. There are competing priorities, resource limitations, and sometimes a lack of political will. Given that, which justice mechanism or form of prosecution for perpetrators of attacks on education do you think is most likely to break through the gridlock and be used in the next five or so years? So which form of prosecution, which justice mechanisms do you think are most likely to break through these competing priorities, these resource limitations, and this lack of political will sometimes to be used in the next five or so years? Um, it's a good question, uh, but not an easy one. I don't think that there's one magical solution. All of these mechanisms exist because they meet a need um, at a particular time. Now, I, w I would like to go back to our 
the point that I made earlier around uh, national uh, laws uh, and national prosecutions and what can happen at the domestic level. Because, you know, as a starting point, that is where we should begin. Um, and before we even get to the accountability point, we really must ensure that we're seeing that, um, that armed forces uh, are trained and that we should be ensuring that there are accountability processes at that level so that um, you know the commands the commanders and the command structure all are aware of what their obligations are and ensuring that they're holding their soldiers to account so you know the, that that is the, that is a starting point it is about the conduct on the battlefield um, it's about what we can prevent but when we talk about accountability you know we we shouldn't dismiss one for the other. Um, the fact that there can be, and we have now seen, um, prosecutions at the domestic level is incredibly important. Um, the ICC, as we've seen, uh, does have the framework to actually be able to prosecute. Um, we need to ensure that we see a willingness for all perpetrators to be investigated uh, and prosecuted at the international court and through other international uh, judicial mechanisms. But you know, that sends a very, these are for the most serious crimes, um, in which attacks on education and the recruitment of children and attacks on students are some of the most serious crimes. So strengthening and working and ensuring that the office of the prosecutor continues to include these crimes in the investigation is fundamentally important and there will always be a place for it. But we do know that the road to international justice is a long one. So it must be supplemented um, with things like the monitoring and reporting mechanism. But the one thing that I would say about any mechanism if over the next five years is not about prioritizing one over the other. It's about ensuring that whatever resources we are investing into the International Criminal Court or the monitoring and reporting mechanism, ensure that these are robust mechanisms that can do their job. And that, ensure, that means that you know, we are actually giving a true and factual account of all the perpetrators um, of, of these sort of crimes within the monitoring and reporting um, framework um, and I think that you know the political will will is something that we need to continue to, to lobby on but there is it takes political will whether it's at the International Criminal Court whether it is at the MRM and the Secretary General's report um, we this isn't something that will magically go away in, in, in any uh, or even at the domestic level in any of the uh, the fora so, you know, there isn't, I haven't dodged the question. Uh, what I would say to the person that posed the question is that all of these have a place and they all must actually be strengthened over the next five years rather than prioritised and deprioritised. That's a very valuable perspective because it says rather than look for one superhero answer, so to speak, we build robust, robust systems across the board. And then I think we have a more structured approach I'm, I'm looking now just to see if we have any in-person questions. I don't think I see anyone, but I want to make sure that we're not um, excluding anyone before I ask our final question. Sorry. Um, oh, yes. Okay. So we have one in-person question. Everyone. Good evening. My name is Mohamed Kari. I'm the director of. Good evening, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening. Majority student. So my question is that, how can government integrate an education to those al majorists that are working around and uh, are being using by? non-state armed group and just killing like that how can government in can integrate a western education to the sangayas thank you um just to confirm you'd like to find out talk about how governments can integrate um i don't the are majority um, yes. children and um the uh 
uh, who are being used by non-state actors. actors. How yes. can we engage? Um, how can we have a robust education system mm -hmm. that can really take the children out of the streets by making sure that um, the Amajiri children are, are, educated. are educated so that non-state actors will not use them? Are, are yes. we correct? Did we? Did we? Um, was that correct? Okay. Who would you recommend to answer that? I, 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 can, I can make a try. Okay. Now, it's the, the issue of, uh, especially in Nigeria, the issue of our children must be dealt with in terms of um, um, getting them to take benefit of the investor basic education, which the government has already provided. We must be able to um, give them a program that can kind of empower them through education and also helping them to locate their families because the best place to bring up a child is within the uh, confines of the family uh, where the father and mother are providing guidance and protection for them. We must be able to have an educational system that will take care of their survival in terms of um, um, giving them advantage of education early and when they finish that education, they also provide them something to do. Because you can see the case of Nigeria is um, very pathetic because non sex actors have used these children as shield. They have provided um, a kind of supply chain for, for Boko Haram activity. And um, these children have vengeance on society. When they see other children that are going to school, they are not happy and they can easily be used by non-state actors against the state and against other people. So our educational system must make sure that we provide all these imaginary children the right to education, which is already in the law. So the state governments must pay, take proactive steps to make sure that these children are really kept off the streets you see that what happens most times is that uh, they, they, they arrest them and take them away. And we at the Commission, at the Human Rights Commission, are saying, no, you don't criminalize these things. These children are need, they are victims, actually. And the, the, the educational system must provide for them in such a way that their right to survival can be, um, uh, can be realized. That, that's a very insightful perspective because, yes, they are victims of the system as well. We have our final question here for Dr. Nanima. And the question is, in the ACERW model law, or more broadly, what do you see as the most effective services or forms of redress to support survivors in their recovery after an attack on education? Thank you so much uh, for that question. I took the liberty to get my video off just such that I could be a little more audible. I would start by saying that it does not only offer one strand in terms of remedies. More often when we are thinking about remedies, it's about uh, criminal law or criminalization, imprisonment, or it's about civil law and having reparations. But it takes the step further that at the end of the day, if we're talking about this child, there should be a holistic development that speaks to the various aspects that, this, that have been affected by this child. Why I'm saying this, more often we have had uh, disarmament, demobilization, and integrated back into and join the armed groups. So to avoid such a situation, it's not only about using the criminal elements, it's not only about using uh, preparations, but it's also about ensuring that, we provide, that there, are psycho there are psychological services that are provided for the children. There are aspects where these children are taken through a process of unlearning where they have learned. I'll give an example. There's a time we went to a country where there had been a lot of war and we're following up on some of the observations, on some of the recommendations we gave on, on a particular case. And it was established that when you ask the children to play, the plays that they would have would be about having a gun, 
about having uh, about fighting about killing another when you have the same question for children in a peaceful environment it will be about a child playing as uh, let me say cooking something a child playing with a doll so uh, because of because the model speaks to promotion it speaks to protection it speaks to criminalization it speaks to rehabilitation uh, it's it speaks to governments engaging their obligations it speaks to political accountability it offers a holistic approach so I wouldn't say that there is one approach that it offers, but rather a holistic approach that looks at the various avenues which speak to the betterment of this child. Perhaps if there's one thing that I should add, at times the, the narrative is uh, there are no finances, uh, we don't have funds to do this, but at times it's about prioritization. Why I'm speaking to this, it's something that uh, my colleague Tirana has spoken to and Mona as well. At times it's about prioritizing what should be done for the child. Once we start having political commitment, once we start having political support, once we start having political accountability towards that, then that's a step in the right direction. But it also starts with questioning and giving answers to why we have uh, these uh, armed conflicts in the, in the first place. It's not only about the high level meetings, well, that is good, but let's look at the sources. Are there structural sources in society? Where are these problems coming from? How can the community engage from a community perspective? How does the army engage from that perspective? How does the government engage whereby we have things such as curriculum development? I know some countries uh, such as Uganda where they have curriculum development for the army, not only when they are working, uh, when they are playing their trade in the country, but even when they go on peacekeeping missions. Uh, where they ensure that for every detached there is a peace and security, a, there is a child protection officer. Uh, there are other initiatives that are being taken by the AU to to promote, sorry, to train uh, child protection officers. That at one time they will be rostered, and it's instructive that. It has been uh, aligned, it's just by one aspect that, that brings the conversation at the top to the bottom at where the country is at, to the national level, uh, to the national engagement is provided. So while it does not only use the criminal element, it uses, it uses various alternatives on the table, such that at the end of the day, there's a logical conclusion of having a child who grows up, let's say, in 20 years' time, when he has completely changed to be a useful citizen in his own community. Thank you. Thank you so, Thank much, you so much, Robert. The, your ne the network is really a big challenge. Um, I would be, at this point in time, be expecting that um, our panelists will give us closing remarks. Um, of course, we expect that this should be in at least three minutes so that we don't uh, um, go beyond the time. If Mona is still there, uh, I know she has an engagement which may take her out, but if she's not there, I am there. Oh, am Mona there. is there. Please, Mona, can you uh, give us closing remarks in three minutes? No, thank you very much. It's just actually less than three minutes. Just to thank you very much for this important initiative and really for bringing it in bo on board uh, uh, the United Nations, but also a number of actors. I want to, in particular, uh, thank the, wor uh, the work that Robert Duyan is doing in the African in the, in the context of the African Union. It's really very important that we have partnerships in this uh, in this regard. And I think working together to achieve you know not, uh, common understandings and common common approaches to accountability, I think is really important. I really also want to emphasize the important work of civil society. And here we have with us Human Rights Watch, and I'm really very pleased that we have this partnership with the United Nations regional organizations, uh, civil society, but as well as with you, uh, the organizers, the Human Rights Commission of Nigeria. All of this is really, really important that we are 
working together in this very important, I think, uh, uh, really difficult issues. I think the, the key point that I want to make, and I will close with that, is that educational institutions are not only a question for for our presence as uh, as our uh, our present as uh, as nations, but it's also about our future and the future of our children. So not only the child themselves, uh, the child, but the right to education has to be assumed through the protection of the children themselves and their institution. The the declaration that they, that you have is extremely important in moving us in this regard. And I think we need to do a lot more to make this point sink in that uh, educational institutions and our children's right to education has to be um, untouchable, has to be, has to be, and those who actually at attack them must be brought to account. So thank you very much for this initiative. Thank you for the partnership and uh, looking forward to working with you further on these important issues. Thank you very much, Muna. Thank you, thank you very much. We will now be calling on um, Robert to please give us his uh, closing remarks. Thank you so much. I would like to reiterate uh, what Mona has said. Uh, it's, it's a very great engagement. It's an honor to be here and thanks for directing the conversation on this very critical matter. One thing that I should remind us about, uh, that we should continue having an introspection about, is that whenever we have an attack on education, we often create a platform for a cycle, especially in the context of armed conflict. That cycle is always through the proliferation of firearms, where we get the AK-47, where we get indoctrination of our children, where they are told to use it. At the end of the day, you discover that uh, it's in some places, it's bought for very little money, money that could buy chicken. It's uh, very easy to use. That is in ports, and children learn to use it, and it's deadly. But when we have education, um, when the attack is not only just on the facility of education, but we're talking about the entire chain, the facility, the children, the teachers, the need for political support to ensure it does not happen, the need for special and better measures, the need to ensure that uh, the enjoyment of the rights of our children should not be cut across because they are political, uh, political or civil or socioeconomic rights, but we engage all steps as per Article 1 and 2 of the Charter. I think that speaks volumes to ensuring that government take all steps that they can to ensure that the enjoyment of the rights in the charter are enjoyed by are, are, are greatly enjoyed by the children and to this end we shall ensure that our children will enjoy education and it will benefit them and those other aspects such as indoctrination i believe will fall away thank you so much thank you so much robert the the right of our children to enjoy education can never be overemphasized now we'll be asking um Tirana, to please give us our closing remarks. Thank you so much um, for moderating and for creating the space um, for today's conversation. Real pleasure to share um, the space with Mona and Robert today for the thought and their interventions. I, I would like to end, I guess, on a, on a somewhat positive note um, because what has been really encouraging since the last Safe Schools Conference in Spain is the number of countries that have begun to implement protections domestically in their laws, policies and practices. And as I stated earlier, accountability really does begin at the domestic level. Uh, and therefore, countries really need to have the necessary laws and policies in place to hold back bad actors to account. Uh, and last week, actually, the Global Coalition uh, to Protect Education from Attack released this report, uh, which I'm sure that people in the room have already seen, um, collecting examples of laws, policies and practices in 57 countries to protect schools and universities from military use. And many of these examples have come in just in the last few years since the adoption of the Safe Schools Declaration. 
And so for, if you're a government official uh, listening today who knows that your country hasn't yet taken the steps to implement protections for schools through military use, I would encourage you to, to look at this report and to see what other countries have done um, and maybe find some inspiration there. But you can actually find it on the Coalition's website, protectingeducation.org. Um, and these examples just show us that change and progress is possible. Um, and so to all the members of the Safe Schools community, you deserve a lot of credit um, for demonstrating that. And, you know, just the space, the place that we are today um, is really extraordinary. And um, I commend uh, all of the partners in this work um, for their efforts and their commitment. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Serena. And um, here we are. We are all aware that this session is um, about moving forward. After all these uh, discussions for, for the past few days, the Safe School Declaration, as you know, is a commitment by the countries that have subscribed to the declaration, 102 in number at that date, um, committing themselves to prosecuting, investigating attack on schools, and providing um, remedies providing solutions to survivors and victims. And um, what has resonated all through this discussion today is that moving forward, we must encourage strong legal systems. We must put in place legal measures, both nationally and internationally, so that prosecutions can be strengthened, so that investigations can be strengthened, and so that remedies for survivors of attack on schools can be better protected and, and the future of our children were protected. So on that note, I want to thank um, the panelists and hand over to the um, Master of Ceremonies to, to take further the process. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for that conversation. You moderated it so clearly and, and you're right. We must look at building structures locally and internationally. Again, our thanks to Mohammed for his moving account, to Ms. Mona Rishmawi, to Dr. Nanima, to Dr. Cecile Abtel, to Ms. Tirana Hassan, and of course, finally, to our moderator. Can we give them all a round of applause, please? I would like to share with you a couple of videos um, just before we go into our tea break. So you'll watch a video from the EU Commissioner, Yanez sure. Lenacek, and a video from the UNICEF representative in Nigeria, Peter Gates. Can we have the videos, please? Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to address this conference on the topic of safe schools for the first time organized on the African continent. Everyone here agrees that education should be an essential part of every girl's and boy's childhood that schools should be a safe haven. Yet, we also all observe that the attacks on schools, students and teachers are increasing, particularly but not only in the areas of conflict. Schools are targeted and children are attacked while on their way to or from school. Schools are used as bases for combat and to recruit children. As a result, many drop out and do not finish their education. We see it happening here in Sahel region, but also in Afghanistan, in crisis in Ethiopia, Chad, Syria, Yemen or Myanmar, among many others. We see it happening too often, and not only in the context of armed conflict. This should not be the case. The strong commitment to safe schooling and learning is enshrined in the European Union's policy on education in emergencies and protracted crises, just recently reinforced by the first EU strategy on the rights of the child. As part of the strategy, from the humanitarian angle, the European Union is committed to intensify prevention and support ending grave violations against children affected by armed conflict, advocate for compliance with international humanitarian law, continue allocating 10% of humanitarian aid funding to education in emergencies 
and to promote the endorsement of the Safe Schools Declaration among all member states of the European Union. EU's financial support for education in emergencies translates to a yearly invest investment of around 150 million euro. Personally, I am a strong supporter and champion of education in emergencies. To me, education represents the basis for hope, freedom and resilience. I also see it as a strong tool for peace building. It is up to every one of us who stands behind these efforts to work together and translate commitments into practice by supporting projects, activities and actors who are contributing to the protection of education for all and everywhere. I trust this conference will address key challenges in this respect and most importantly that it will gather ideas on how the international community can assist further with the implementation of the declaration. We owe it to the next generations. Thank you. Hi, my name is Peter Hawkins. I'm the UNICEF representative here in Nigeria. Welcome to you all to this uh, Safe School Conference here in Abuja. It's a very timely time to have held this conference and thank you very much to the Nigerian government for hosting all of us here at this difficult time. Education indeed is under attack globally. Schools have been taken over by military entities. The uh, children have been prevented from going to school and we all know about COVID, but it's the insecurity that has been a major problem. The Safe School Declaration is an important part of the international community's response to ensure that children are able to continue their uh, learning wherever they are in whatever situation they are. Here in Nigeria, we've had our own problems. 1,341 children have been kidnapped since the 9th of December 2020. 17 teachers have indeed been kidnapped as well. There are three things that we've been trying to work on. First and foremost is trying to understand better the reasons why the attacks are taking place. Is it ideological by the insurgents? Is it community conflict between, say, for example, herders and farmers? Or is it banditry, extortion of the worst kind? Uh, secondly, is it for each state to try and develop its own plan for secure education in that state? This is to look at the risks, mitigate against them, to see if a school should be attacked, what kind of res timely response can be launched. But the whole thing is to try and prevent. And then third is the main thing, is to try and ensure that communities themselves are able to protect the schools. They understand the value of learning. Schools reach out to those communities through their school-based management committees to ensure that communities and schools are at one in valuing learning wherever they are. Uh, it's only then that when parents come to the school and understand really what, what their children are, are doing, can they understand the value that there is. Enjoy the conference. I look forward to the outcomes, but mainly I look forward to implementing those outcomes. Thank you very much and have a good two days. We're going to take a tea break, just give everybody an opportunity to again stretch their legs and digest the conversation we've just had. And then we'll see you back here at 3.30 for our closing ceremony, at which point we will reflect, take our key recommendations, and I have some really, really exciting performances that I'm not going to tell you too much about. But we'll see you back here by 3.30. Thank you as always for your engaged attention and have a good break. <laughs>